Wildfire is an interesting thing to talk about always because I, I never cease to be amazed by how much emotional resonance it still has for people. Certainly last year it was uh, being talked about and thought about all over the world um, as the 100th anniversary approached. Um, and as you'll see when I get to the end of the slides and as you would see if you looked at the label on the shirt of the person next to you, um, it's a very pressing and contemporary issue because um, our clothing is once again being produced under conditions that cost people's lives um, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Cambodia. And um, so what I'd like to say is the pictures that I'm going to show you and the mood that I'm going to set is a mood from the early 20th century. But um, there was an amazing uh, leader of the current Bangladesh garment workers movement, which is a movement that has a lot of similarities to the one that I'm going to be describing from 100 years ago in the United States, in that it is uh, led and peopled largely by young women, and uh, thou thousands of whom have gone into the streets to protest unsafe uh, working conditions and absurdly low wages um, and who have uh, many of them paid with their lives not just because of fires but because the Bangladesh government has uh, seen fit to attack them and indeed uh, there was a very recent murder um, of the, one of the lead organizers in the Bangladesh garment workers movement. So as you, you think back to 1911 uh, hear the, the voice of the leader of the current <coughs> Bangladesh movement who said to everyone in the room on the, on the actual 100th anniversary of the Triangle Fire last March 25th, she said, you may think it's 2011, she said, but for us in the shops where we work, it's still 1911. So what I wanted to do is to set a little context before the fire because one of the things that was most important to me in commemorating the fire is to make clear that the young women and men who perished in it were not simply nameless victims. Uh, they were activists themselves, many of whom had come into the consciousness of the country a couple of years earlier um, when uh, New York had what was called the uprising of the 20,000, and actually probably over the course of the four months that the strike lasted, uh, included closer to 40,000 uh, young immigrants, mostly East European Jews, Italians, um, with a smaller number of uh, Irish, native-born whites, and a, um, a few black workers. And um, they were known to the city because they had captured the hearts of the city because they were, they were young. They were girls, mostly. Um, and they had uh, protested for their rights in a way that people could not forget, braving police clubs, and, um, and speaking out for what their dream of coming to America had been. Um, probably you're familiar with these kind of pictures, the images um, of the Lower East Side at that moment, the most densely populated square mile um, on earth at that moment in the first decade of the 20th century, apart uh, from certain neighborhoods in Beijing. It included immigrants from around the world. Every block was different, but uh, the particular area that has become most famous, Hester Street, Delancey Street, the place where um, most of the girls who worked in the Triangle Factory lived, um, was populated mostly by East European Jews. And they were, as I mentioned, militant. I really like this picture because it really makes clear to you, these are girls, right? We're not just calling them unsere Fabrenta Medlach, our fiery girls, as the Yiddish paper, the Jewish Daily Forward, uh, that was read. It was a socialist paper read almost daily by most Jewish immigrants in the neighborhood as they called them Unzara Fabrenta Medlach, our fiery girls. They were girls, 13, 14. Um, and from the beginning, reporters, when this strike broke out in uh, 1909, they were really struck by these girls' knowledge of American history. And, um, and their sense of what they had come for. Uh, for many of them coming from the East European uh, Jewish Stetlach, the little villages where Jews were allowed to live in the Russian Pale of Settlement, they had not been able to go to school either because Jewish schools were for boys or because schools run by the Russian Empire excluded Jews. And so for them, this image of coming to the United States, this place that had public schools, 
where people could go for free um, was very compelling, very exciting. And for many of them, like my grandmother who started working um, in those shops when she was nine, there was uh, grave disappointment because uh, they didn't get to go to school. They were uh, in the shops. And the Triangle Factory in its early years had something called the kindergarten where they had workers uh, as young as, as five years old. And the reason they had them was, one, because their fingers were so tiny they could trim the excess threads off the bottom of the shirts uh, very effectively, but also because they were so little. There was some child labor legislation at that time. They could jump in barrels um, where the bolts of cloth were kept, excuse me, and they would um, be covered over and, and inspectors wouldn't find them. In the shops, because they were so interested in education, because they were so desperate for education, um, these young girls and women read to each other. It's how many of them learned English. Um, and uh, as uh, Pauline Newman, one of the lead organizers of this strike that would break out in 1909, recalled and, and told me, um, we like to read about Dickensian England, and we like to read Thomas Hood's Song of the Shirt, about garment workers and their industrial revolution in the English mills. They said because it echoed our lives and because we were ready to rise. So they found education in the shops. They found education that made them say we are not slaves, abolish slavery, but they had a kinship with slaves. And um, they, they found education that began to give them the, the fundamentals of socialism. Now, in uh, the first decade of the 20th century, the rate at which garments were produced doubled between 1900 and 1905 because of the, um, the development of, of electric sewing machines. And uh, for these girls, they went through what I call the shock of the shops. Um, they came from you know, pre-industrial culture in, in Eastern Europe and in Southern Italy. Many of them, you know, were, were women who had made cheese and bread and gone to the markets and, you know, sold things. They were not economically naive. They were fairly economically sophisticated, certainly not um, middle class housewives who, who stayed in the home. Um, but uh, the experience of going from that kind of family production into industrial production was hard. It was loud. It was fast. Um, and it subjected these girls to sexual harassment on the part of foremen, um, to you know being being yelled at. They were in garments were not produced in big fancy modern factories. Garments tended to be produced through subcontracting. In other words, the new department stores, um, you know, A and S and um, and Macy's and the, the the stores that you first start to get in this period um, would contract out for 400 shirts, and um, that, you know, the person who got the contract might find some immigrant who was here a few years more than the girls just off the boat who rented this little room, right? And you, you need to keep your labor costs down. So, um, you know, you have a little coal stove, maybe, and the, um, the fabric, so the coal dust is in the air, the fabric dust is in the air, it's loud, it's small, it's unventilated, it's very unpleasant. It's very unpleasant. Um, and there was a real sense of shock, and th this is the same era as you get the first generation of college-educated young women. Um, progressive era, many of them decided to go out into the world for a while and do some good work before they married, if they ever married. It was a large percentage that didn't. Many of them came to live in the settlement houses in these immigrant neighborhoods. And they went out and studied conditions. And what they found was what they called young old girls. Girls who had the, the skin and the color um, of, of old people because they worked all days in, the, in those dark environments um, and, uh, and, and in that, you know, inhaling the kind of dust that made them breathe badly and cough. So those were the conditions, but they were not, they were not um, shrinking violets. <laughs> they were angry. And so um, some of these young girls began organizing from shop to shop. Now interestingly, Triangle was a nice factory. Triangle was modern. Triangle had high ceilings. Um, it had uh, you know, wider aisles. It wasn't one of these sweatshops, actually. It was a factory, and it, and it advertised itself as such. And getting a job at Triangle was really, it was a, it was a plum job. 
paid, paid relatively well compared to a lot of these sweatshops. Usually, these were young girls who'd been here a little longer. They weren't the newest immigrants off the boat. And um, so those young girls in the, in, in the Triangle factory and in the Lyserson factory, some of the bigger shops in, in New York at the time, were a lot of the fancy, the, the prevailing fashionable clothes um, were produced. And you see these girls, they have some nice hats and some kind of fashionable clothes. They, they, one of the things they did for themselves to make themselves feel more American is they, um, they were able to imitate and make for themselves the fashions they couldn't have afforded to buy um, in the ready-to-wear stores. Um, and they were very proud of it. And in fact, um, Nan Enstad has written about these, these young women um, after my first book, Common Sense, said, you know, the one thing you got wrong was you didn't appreciate that they were teenagers and they were really into fashion and they were, you know, they weren't quite as serious as you made them out to be. And one of the things that really bothered them was they never had a place to put those hats where they wouldn't get crushed. Um, they'd worked really hard on them. Um, anyway, so these young, fashionable girls in these shops start organizing in the summer of 1907. They go and live uh, in a kind of Occupy campsite um, on the Palisade, Palisades over the Hudson River. And they live there all summer in the summer of 1907. And they organize um, this huge rent strike in the city to protest um, rising prices of housing. And they work together with their mothers um, on that, that, that work around you know, just price for bread and meat and housing. Um, and then they decide, you know, we need to start organizing for ourselves against these conditions um, in the shops. And they do. And they go door to door. And they organize not just the big factories, but the sweatshops, the little ones, the little rooms. And in November 1909, they decide they're going to do something which had never been done before um, by women in the United States. And that is organize a general strike throughout the city. It had been hard to organize the garment trades. It was all these, little, all these little shops that would disappear from one day to the next. So they decided we're going to get together in Cooper Union, the Great Hall of the People, where you know Abraham Lincoln and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and lots of uh, famous speeches about liberty and justice had been made. And they gathered in the basement of Cooper Union. And um, Clara Lemlich, who was uh, a Lyserson shop worker, recent immigrant, uh, very influenced by the Russian Revolution before she left Ukraine, um, very influenced by the anti-Jewish pogroms, uh, got up on stage and said, you know, because everyone got up and begged them, they said, don't strike. Sam Gompers, the head of the American Federation of Labor, got up and said, don't strike. These middle class women who are allies in the Women's Trade Union League, college women, Mary Dreyer and others, got up and said, please don't strike. You girls, you have, as the journalist Theresa Malkiel, socialist immigrant, said, you know, they, they walked away from the one thing standing between their families and starvation. But they did it. Clara got up and said, I'm tired of all this. You people don't work where we work. You don't endure the conditions we endure. Um, I move we go into general strike. And that's the response. People throw those hats in the air, and they lift their hands, and they become uh, very excited, and um, to give you a sense, this was definitely a Jewish audience. Benjamin Feigenbaum, who was um, one of the organizers of this early International Ladies Garment Workers Union, still really small, got up on stage and said um, in Yiddish, will you take the Jewish oath, and you know, if I forget the O Jerusalem, may my tongue um, cleave to the roof of my mouth, may my right arm wither, but they substituted union for Jerusalem, um, and, and the strike was on, and they really had no idea what was going to happen. They, they just they decided to do it. And the next morning, all over the Lower East Side, girls in their shops were waiting for a signal. And when the signal came, they didn't know how well it would go, but tens of thousands walked off their job. And they, and they stood on the street corners of the city through the cold fall and winter um, of 1909 into 1910, and they sold special um, editions of the New York Socialist Call that were printed for this strike in Yiddish, Italian, and English. And um, they, these girls were on roller skates. You can't actually see them. But they skated around selling you know, special copies of the strike edition to raise money for the strike fund. Because these families did not, the union was not a big union. They didn't really have a strike fund. The families didn't have money. Um, to support them if these girls weren't working. So in the, in the midst of striking for several months, these young girls had to find ways to support themselves. They 
marched around the city, and one of the things that they tried to do was to get support from the wealthier um, women in New York City. It was the kind of the last push of the women's suffrage movement, the last decade. And some of those young college women and some very wealthy women, uh, including some of the uh, wives and daughters of the most powerful men in the world, Ann Morgan, the daughter of banker J.P. Morgan, um, who was at that point probably the most powerful banker in the world. Um, Alva Belmont, um, whose um, husband was um, a racing fortune, and, Al and she was a Vanderbilt herself, um, was out there every day when these young girls picketing would get arrested. And she'd go to the Jefferson Market Prison on 8th Street and 6th Avenue in, in what's now Greenwich Village and bail them out and stand on the steps of the courthouse and say how the, the movement for the right for women to vote was changing and these young girls now were getting involved. And they were very clear about what they wanted. I mean, these, these again, these girls would talk. And so there were wonderful interviews with reporters where they're talking about what their rights are under the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and they're very aware of what they want, um, though they're, they're young, you know, they're, they're kids. They're like high school student age, most of them. But the city came to know them, and because it took place in New York, um, the media capital of the, of the country at that time and perhaps of the world, um, lots of people came to know them um, and to be impressed by them. And you began to get... Um, middle and upper class women also joining the picket line with them. There's Clara Lumlick at the center, the, um, the young girl who makes the strike, the, the speech that sets off the strike. And these are the, the, um, the strikers, but what happened is that the police violence against the strikers and the um, hired company guard violence against the strikers was pretty intense. Clara Lumlick had six ribs broken um, by police clubs. And, um, and there was not a lot of sympathy for them in the beginning. One uh, young girl was dragged off to court um, with her head swathed in bandages. She'd clearly been clubbed. She was bloody. Um, and the police, policeman accused her of assaulting him um, and resisting arrest. And the judge um, pronounced her guilty, sent her to the workhouse, and said, you are on strike against God and nature. You're not supposed to be out there on the picket line. You're not good girls. You're bad girls. And so one of the things the um, companies did is they sent out prostitutes um, to walk on the line. Um, and uh, the answer, and it was very interesting, Clara Lumlick later on in the suffrage movement in the next year um, would advocate for the rights of prostitutes and, and talk about the double standard of how men were not arrested and, and these women were. But the girls were not phased by being called Streetwalkers. They said better to be a streetwalker than a scab. At least it's an honest profession. <laughs> so they were they were very unflappable. They were very newsworthy. They gave good quote, um, and they the violence abated a little bit because um, the wealthy women and the college girls started walking on the picket lines with them, and then the police became a little more careful about who they clubbed. Um, and uh, again, the young girls were very clear about it. They said, it's, you know, you can talk about protecting women and chivalry and all that, but it, you know, it's very clear to us that there's a stark difference between um, our lives and theirs and who gets protected um, and who doesn't. Okay, so here's the problem. The problem is that when they negotiate a settlement to the strike, one of the issues that's paramount for these young girls um, is the condition of so many of these shops with the flammable fabric strewn around. Um, and uh, the, they really want the shops cleaned up. They want the fabric strips, scraps off the floor. Um, they want you know clear exits. They're very concerned, and they know what they're concerned about. But in the negotiations at the end of the strike, in a lot of the shops, it gets belittled. Even the union men, the negotiators, are like, oh, this is such a female issue. You know, you're worried about the shops being sloppy. Right? We, we, we want to talk about hardcore issues like, you know, wages and hours. And um, the girls were very clear, though, because there had already been fires. They knew what they were talking about. They knew what it was they were concerned about. It was called grass linen that most of these shirtwaists were made out of. It was very shiny and prickly. It was almost like a parchment kind of thing. And it was extremely fat, flammable. The fire just, you know, burned it like treated paper really, really fast. And indeed, um, in 1910, November 1910, there was a terrible garment fire in a Newark, New Jersey garment factory right across the river um, that killed 26 young girls. And um, Rose Schneiderman of the Women's Trade Union League, an immigrant cap maker, about four foot nine, red haired, 
firebrand, they called her the Red Red Rose, um, said, we warn you that girls are being burned to death every day. We, it's it's kind of what we're being told now. Um, we're warning you about this, and um, somebody needs to pay attention. But again, you know, as she, as Rose Schneiderman put it, you know, workers' lives are cheap. There's always more of us than uh, are needed for the job. So you know, if you lose a few, a few more come off the boat, and there's no problem. So that wasn't supposed to be a problem in the modern airy triangle Sherways factory. Big windows, fire escapes. They advertise in all the women's magazines. Get your clothes made in, you know, this modern um, business centric environment, not in these, you know, old fashioned kind of medieval sweatshops. And of course, the building is fireproof. So you don't have to worry about these terrible tragedies taking place there. My grandmother was really happy when she got a, got a, a job at Triangle. She was fortunately not there the day of the fire. Um, if you can see that the building is in fact fireproof. Just barely scorched on the outside, but that's not where the workers were. They were on the inside. The building's still there. It's uh, used as a chemistry and anthropology building by NYU, same building. On the 100th anniversary, when um, tens of thousands of people marched down from Union Square carrying shirtwaists to lay roses and names at the, the base of the, of the building, there are people in there who had no idea what, what it was, just in there doing, you know, doing experiments, leading classes. So that's the outside. And this is what the inside looked like after the fire. So what happened? Somebody dropped a cigarette, warm spring afternoon, Saturday. They were working Saturday, March 25th, 1911. Um, and it was on the middle floor. The triangle occupied the 7th, 8th, and 9th floors of the Ash Building on Green Street in Washington Place, just a block off fashionable Washington Square Park. Beautiful townhouses surrounding the park. Few pretty wealthy people lived right, right around the corner. And um, the fabric caught just as the young strikers a year before had said it would. And it caught so fast that some of the young girls on the, in the middle floor was the problem. The upper floor, ninth floor people got out. They went up onto the roof and it was already NYU. NYU students stood on the next building and helped people to come across. Um, and. Um, and many, many people were saved that way. The seventh floor, people were able, elevator operators, including um, some very, very brave um, young men who just kept going back and forth in the fire as long as they could to come up and get the girls out. But the people on the middle floor were goners. Um, there was no way. And one of the reasons for it was, of course, that the doors were locked. One of the doors was locked. There were two exits. One of the doors was locked to prevent theft. They wanted to be able to kind of frisk the girls when they left. And one of them um, actually closed, uh, was closed off to escape because um, the door opened in. And as people rushed the door and started to pass out from smoke inhalation, um, the bodies piled up in front of the door and there was no way to get out. It's really interesting, you know, there's always, there are always people with personal relationships to this when I, when I talk about it. And, um, there was a man, and we did the talk in Montpelier, whose father and grandfather were New York City firemen. And that was this code about, you know, going around, it was a gospel, going around talking to um, buildings that held large gatherings or businesses to talk about how doors have to open out. And it became, of course, fire code um, in most places, although I always make a very dramatic splash at Dartmouth with the doors in the old buildings still open in. Um, and you just close it and show how, you know, it gets blocked and that's it. Well, it happened very quickly. The deaths happened very quickly. The whole thing was over in half an hour. Um, but because some of the girls who were trapped in there in the seventh floor saw their colleagues burn to death so fast, that, as I said, they were charred skeletons at the sewing machines. Um, they decided that they couldn't bear the thought of that fate, and so they stepped out first onto the fire escape, which 
um, collapsed because it had uh, never been up to code. And then they began to jump. There, there were um, the, there were fire trucks that brought um, you know nets, but you don't hold in a net either after jumping from the eighth floor. People went right through the nets. They hit the ground so hard, some of them went right through the pavement because there were steam tunnels below. And the thing that newspaper reports of the time make clear is that part of the trauma was that police recognized some of the same girls they'd arrested on the picket lines a couple of years earlier. Sometimes they even knew their names. So within a half hour, 146, 145 were dead. One lingered for a few days. Um, she actually survived the fall briefly. And it wasn't just the 145, although that was so terribly shocking. It was the fact that with 800 workers in the Triangle factory, and 650 of them did get out alive, um, it's not something we often talk about, so there's a lot of really great eyewitness testimony about the fire and what it was like. Um, the factory had connections to most families in that area on the Lower East Side. And then in addition to them, it was estimated that 10,000 people watched. It was a warm, warm spring afternoon, um, a block off of one of the most fashionable parks in the city. And so many of the people who watched in horror as this happened, and you know, it certainly evokes images of, of for us of 9/11 and you know, falling bodies, um, because they were on fire, falling down. It was it was just an unforgettable sight, and the sound, you know, of bones, the smell of burnt flesh, the sound of bones crashing to the pavement, the blood and spray of blood. It was it was a horrendous, unforgettable moment in the life of New York, and it was witnessed by many, many, many people, including um, a young social worker um, who had been active in something called the Consumers League, which tried to get middle class people aware of how their clothes are made, and to get them to uh, patronize clothing made humanely and not patronize clothing made in sweatshops. Her name was Frances Perkins, and um, she was then an aide um, to uh, the assembly person from that district, Al Smith, um, who went to visit the family of every single uh, victim of the fire over the next few days. The two of them were really key because they would, they would devote the rest of their careers, Perkins in particular, of course, to um, making sure she vowed she would devote the rest of her life to trying to prevent future triangles. Um, and... Of course, Perkins goes on first to become aide to Al Smith as he's governor. She helps to develop the Factory Investigating Commission um, that New York State and 11 other industrial states put, put in place after the fire. Um, and what was really interesting is she hired girls from the Triangle Factory, Pauline Newman being one, to take these politicians in to the factories where women worked in the state. And they described uh, Al Smith and Robert Wagner, who would later become the U.S. Senator, who whose name is on the Wagner Labor Relations Act, um, which is still the law on the books today um, that allows for collective bargaining and um, for recognition of unions um, and makes it illegal to fire someone for joining a union. Um, she had Al, Paulie Newman took Al, Al Smith and Robert Wagner through these ice-covered holes in the wall in um, upstate New York canneries. Um, where you know that 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 little you know ice covered hole was supposed to be the fire escape um, for you know for these young girls and um, what Perkins later talked about is that that experience imbued um, the legislation that Smith and Wagner and Perkins um, would later pass with a real visceral understanding of what what these you know these workers' lives were like for the people of the city of New York. Um, this was an event that didn't end in one day um, because the bodies lay in a makeshift morgue on the 23rd Street Pier and families came for days to try to find their loved ones, to try to identify them. Some of them were burned so badly they couldn't. Um, but in the end, after this, this, this ritual that went on and on um, 
people finally did find and identify most of the victims. These are amazing, these lantern slides that are now in the Cornell Library really give you a feel uh, for this. Were they in color or were they colorized? They were, hand, they were hand colored. But they're just amazingly vivid and they're glass. They were glass plates so that you have this level of detail that you don't usually have in, um, in pictures uh, in that moment. Uh, estimates of between four and 500,000 people lined the funeral route. For the, these were for the six unknown victims who were identified only in time for the 100th anniversary last year. There was such a sense that this was everybody's tragedy. What do you mean they were identified only in time? There were six, 140 were identified, I mean, you know, over this, the, the pictures I just showed you of people looking at the coffins and, but six were not identified. There was a, a scholar um, who worked on it. Uh, for the last 10, 15 years to figure out the identities of the six um, unknown victims of the fire whose bodies were carried in that funeral march. And he finally got all the names um, for the 100th anniversary last year. Wow. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, for labor, turning point. Can't really see this, but it's the late Ladies' Waste and Dressmakers Union. We mourn our loss. Um, the fire intensified the wave of women's labor, girls' labor uprisings that was sweeping the country um, between 1910 and 1919. Um, after New York, um, strikes spread to Philadelphia, Boston, Cleveland, Chicago, Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, and eventually um, there was a strike in Brooklyn that had um, 35 languages represented. It was, um, it was a, a, a galvanizing moment in the history of the country, and most of them are these young immigrant girls, hundreds of thousands of them, so that by 1919, when women got the vote, um, in the garment trades, 40%, almost half, were unionized. It's an unprecedented number um, for you know, the number of people who were unionized. Well, the outcry led to a trial of um, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, the owners of um, the factory, and the trial they were charged with um, the deaths of 75, and um, the trial hinged on whether or not the witnesses could prove that the doors were locked. And um, the public sentiment, you can see, right? The man, you can't quite see it there, but the guy who's holding the door shut while these girls burn behind it and cry out, um, his suit is made of dollar bills. So public sentiment was very inflamed. One of a hundred martyrs, is anyone to be punished for this? Cartoon ran during the trial, and, and you can't quite see, but there's a sign there that still says operators wanted. They're still hiring. Um, who, who went to trial? Who did they charge? They charged the two owners of the factory with locking the doors. And there you have Carner and the jury are questioning employees trying to get a sense of, that was the whole hinge and that it was one of those trials of the century. Max Steuer, who defended um, Blank and Harris, was one of those flashy, you know, lawyers of the moment. Um, all eyes were on this trial. And what the defense did shouldn't be that unfamiliar to anyone who um, knows the rhetoric about immigrants today. They put the girls on trial. It was their fault. They were hysterical. They were they were portrayed as kind of bovine, you know, cow-like, and you know, subhuman intelligence. They they got hysterical. If they hadn't gotten hysterical, they all would have gotten out. Um, and in the end, you know, people came in to say they, you know, expert testimony and all kinds of people paid by the company um, to say that the door was actually open. We know the door was open, even though these young girls who were there talked about. Um, the experience of finding the door locked and how it was always locked to keep them, you know, keep them in their place. There were very emotional crowd scenes outside the courtroom and outside the building all the time. So the trial wasn't just played out in courtrooms, it was played out actually on the streets of the city. And there were pictures of the witnesses, girls again, a bow in her hair. But in the end, she was not believed, the witnesses were not believed, Blank and Harris were acquitted. And um, they 
gave, uh, I believe it was a $75 settlement, more money than certainly than it is now, but not much, um, to each of the families um, of the victims. Here's some trial coverage. The burnt question mark. Women tells of fight for life at barred doors. So Blank and Harris disappeared into the ether, opened another shot. Really interesting. I was doing this talk in Montpelier last year, and one of their grandsons, Harris's grandson, was there. And the librarians warned me about it, and they said, you know, this might be hostile. Um, and in fact, he wanted to tell me how um, his grandfather persisted in, you know, being the monster that he was, and how as late as the 30s, um, he was uh, paying arm breakers to ride down um, the streets of the of uh, the garment district, the 7th Avenue in the 30s in New York, grab union organizers off the street, pull them into the cab, break their arms, and throw them back out into the street. This was the story that the grandson told me. Interestingly enough, the grandson um, would years later, in, as a hippie in a California commune, fall in love with this woman who turned out to be Al Smith's granddaughter. <laughs> it is perfect, isn't it? All right, well, the problem is, you know, triangle changes everything, right? Perkins goes on to become Secretary of Labor under Franklin Roosevelt, first New York State, pioneers all of this great labor legislation and workmen's comp and safety regs. And, you know, Perkins is the architect of the Social Security Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act, and you've got you know, safety, better safety conditions, and in the 70s, creation of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration just keeps getting better. No. <laughs> OSHA's gutted in the 80s, um, and very quickly, the modern day um, American Triangle Fire happens at the Imperial Foods Company in Hamlet, North Carolina. Underneath the sign that says fire door, do not block, you might notice a padlock. Workers were locked into Imperial Foods. It was a chicken processing plant in North Carolina. These were kind of the, the poorest of the poor rural um, rural South workers. What? They weren't immigrants? Nope. Nope. They were poor white and black Southerners who worked in the Hamlet plant. 25 died, the plant had never been inspected for safety violations. So you create OSHA, you create all the safety regulations, and then you gut the enforcement potential, which is what happened in the 80s, no funding left. There are a handful of inspectors for the entire country. And this factory had never been inspected. The hot pots, the hot oil, mm. caught fire and scalded, even the 49ers survived, were horrendously, horrendously burned. And there was a big outcry, and you have to reinvigorate OSHA. And there was some improvement in, in American shops, um, some. But then you begin to get outsourcing, yeah. right? And so then what starts to happen, of course, is that the goods are being produced overseas. Two years later, the worst um, industrial fire in history in Bangkok, the Coder Industrial Toy Company. 188 killed, almost 500 more wounded in the fire. This is 1993. And if, if, if you can't see it, it's not a great um, uh, quality image, but it's the same thing. It's the bodies lying on the street and people coming to identify family members and rescue workers looking on horrified. And the United States was not without its horrors either. I don't know if any of you remember the El Monte, California sweatshop story in which um, Thai immigrants uh, were brought over and held captive for eight years. Yeah, this, and they're, they're afraid. This is during the raid. They're terrified of their federal agents. They don't know what's going on. No, they don't. Although, um, I believe it was 10 years later, maybe it was a few years later, there's wonderful coverage of these folks becoming citizens, speaking English. Um, but they had literally been kept imprisoned for eight years um, without anybody, um, you know, anybody inspecting the factory. And you see, that's what happened. The 90s is the biggest uh, immigration decade in American history, not the 1890s, but the 1990s. Um, and there was a resurgence of sweatshops to the extent that 
Um, in the same year, 1995, it was estimated in New York City on any given day that a quarter of a million people were working in sweatshops. So the sweatshops came back, and then the sweatshops died out to some degree because it was so much cheaper to produce in Bangladesh by the 21st century. Lowest wages, lowest wages for industrial production in the world. But also, of course, in Cambodia, in Pakistan, um, in El Salvador. And not surprisingly, today's triangles continued. Chittagong textile mill, 50 dead, 100 injured, 2006. There were something like 400 fires between 2006 and 2011 when the 100th anniversary um, of Triangle took place. Here's another one, you can't quite see it, but they're removing the dead after, another, after a garment factory fire in 2006. And the women hit the streets. They got beaten up, some of them have been shot, some of them have been charged with shooting other people when clearly they weren't, but I just, the echoes of these women and the young women 100 years earlier are so intense. Why is it always garments? Why is that like the worst? It's because it's subcontracted and it's unregulated. So, I mean, you know, we all wear these clothes. You know, an educated person can get a job. Yes. Yeah. But also it's that, you know, Walmart and JCPenney and H&M and, you know, all these companies that sell clothes to all of us. Um, can say, oh, it's not us, right? You know, we don't know. We subcontracted to someone who subcontracted to someone. December 2010, yeah, 100 dead in the, in the That's It garment factory. This was Bangladesh. This was Dhaka. Um, and it was, um, clothing was made for H&M, Zara, Walmart, and Kohl's. And so they, they hit the streets in Bangladesh, and the crackdown has been tremendous. It still is. It's going on right now. Um, but they're not giving up. And so, um, you know, what I hope people do is just, you know, the um, International Labor Federation has all these campaigns for different retailers that we all shop at to just tell them their customers want them to put pressure on the places where their garments are made. Um, so that they can be made more fairly. So yeah, that's, I like that's where the slogans are. There unethical fashion brands hiding in your closet. That's the other thing. You can figure out, um, you know, who's engaging in unfair labor practices. This is Nike attempting to bust a very successful union um, of uh, shoemakers in Malaysia. Nike's gotten a lot better because of pressure. Um, the Gap has gotten a lot better because of pressure. H&M, Topshop, Old Navy, Zara, Limited, Abercrombie & Fitch still need to be, still need to be pressured. Yeah. But even made in the U.S. doesn't guarantee they're made fairly, as you saw with the El Monte yeah, shop. That's true. It is really true. So what's really nice is that um, the Bangladesh workers reached out to American workers for the week of the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Fire, and some of them came to the U.S., um, and on the day of the 100th anniversary, it was so amazing in Cooper Union where the 1909 strike started, um, the leader of the Bangladeshi Garment um, Workers Movement, um, uh, Amina Islam, came over to Clara Lumlick's daughter who was there, was like 95, and hugged her. And there's you know, great picture of the two of them standing together. So the centuries met um, as workers talked about um, the conditions um, under which uh, you know, dangerous conditions today. These are the, um, these folks are marching on the 100th anniversary. These are the Chinese women who led the second uprising of the 20,000 garment workers in New York in 1982. You can't quite see them there. They're a little old now, but they're still out there being militant. And you have, you know, hard hats and construction workers out there remembering the Triangle Dead on the 100th anniversary. I love that picture. Well, that's what's interesting. I mean, you know, unions are in such trouble, and none of these clothing, you know, manufacturers in um, in Asia were initially unionized. So um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, it was very successful, and it improved standards of living. And, and this was this is what cons the Consumers League did, and people like Francis Perkins did in the very early years of the, of the century was. Um, Publishing, Clara Lemlich published a piece in Good Housekeeping for middle class women. She said, let me tell you the conditions under which your clothes are made. Right? And you have the, po you have the power as consumers um, to make things better. There is, you can't quite see it, but um, 
Marchers held up shirtwaists, and each of these shirtwaists has the name and the story of um, one of the victims. And they carried the 146 shirtwaists through the streets of the city um, on the day of the 100th anniversary and laid them with all their names at the foot of the building and says, we still mourn our dead and fight for the living. No more sweatshops. I am remembering history. I am making history. Um, one of the really amazing um, uh, ways that the fire is commemorated every year around the city is that um, this really wonderful artist, Ruth Sergal, found where the 146 victims lived. She found the address of every one. Um, and people go around and they chalk the sidewalk um, in front of those buildings. And it's all over, all over you know, lower Manhattan. And what's really interesting is that, of course, people who are now living in those neighborhoods and buildings don't know the story of the fire. So what happens is that you engage in a little history discussion as people are walking over the chalkings. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in so doing, was my, my daughter and her friend were doing this chalking that was actually, the, it was actually a building where my grandparents lived. And um, just totally coincidentally. And um, <laughs> Uh, these people then started telling stories of the Chinese garment workers in sweatshops um, in that same area 20 years ago. So the story of Triangle and the commemoration um, has yielded remarkable, um, remarkable uh, conversations. This is the labor choir. Um, they're wonderful old people. The average age in the choir is over 80. Um, on the night, this is in the Cooper Union Hall, of the Great Hall of the People on the 100th anniversary. Um, and that little red-headed person is Clara Lumlick's daughter who was there um, 100 years later um, to see the place where her mother um, started the uprising. There's her daughter, her granddaughter, and great-granddaughter. So 100 years is not really such a long time. And that's it. So take questions. And oh, look at that, five to eight. What is here? Perfect. <laughs> Thoughts, questions, comments? Yes. Um, you mentioned um, the six that were just identified for the hundredth. Um, who was the person who did the work on that? You know, I'm blanking on his last name. It might be Michael Schwartz, but I can get the, if you email me, I can get you the articles about him. Most of the dead from the fire are buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, and there was a grave for the unknown victims. Um, and uh, he just did everything he could. Um, to track down, you know, the list of people who worked at the uh, factory, um, and you know, I mean, obviously people came and went, and you know, my grandmother worked there and wasn't even there. There were, there were a lot of people who weren't there, but somehow or other, he got conclusive information um, and and identified the the final victims. There's some coverage of it from last year. You could find. It's just kind of amazing when you think about it that no one. I'm assuming it's because they were either burned beyond recognition or that. No one came forward and said they were missing a relative. Well, a lot of these girls were here on their own. You know, they came, they came, and they were going to bring, they were going to send money back to Europe and bring family members later. So um, that's my guess is that you know those final victims did not have families here, who certainly would have come to find them. Or, you know, reported them missing. They probably were just they were living on their own. It's one of the reasons that Clara Lemlich was so militant on the subject of. Um, you know, the unfair treatment of prostitutes, because she said so many of these girls were not earning an, enough of a living and found themselves forced into the streets. She didn't see them as others. She saw them as, as us. Yeah. The victims were predominantly Jewish? Jewish and Italian. Jewish and Italian. Yeah. I mean, there's some horrible stories. And there's one man buried every female in his family. He buried, he buried his wife, he buried his sister, and he buried two or three daughters. I can't remember. It was... Just horrible as an Italian man. So very heavy. Um, what's interesting is that because it isn't so long ago, really, um, in those communities, you know, in the Jewish neighborhood where I grew up and, and among Jews and I think among Italian Americans, um, it's, it's still very vivid and real. And really one of the amazing things about the march um, was that people were carrying shirtwaists. They just volunteered and they would run across family members. So my daughter was carrying one um, of one of the men who died in the fire and ran across this guy who'd come up from North Carolina. He said, can I please carry that? That's my great-grandfather and my grandfather. So, um, and another guy came up and, you know, with his, his little daughters and he, he looked at one of the other shirtwaists and said, I, you know, I wanted the girls 
to know about her. I will tell you about my great aunt, and this is who she was. And so, yeah, it's it's still very much it's still very much part of family memory. And um, there's a nice um, uh, HBO documentary that has some uh, about a half hour uh, long that has uh, interviews with some of these family members of the victims. Yeah. What do you see the answer to um, this continued sad history of fires? And now we have um, people locked back in the U.S. People locked immigrants doing the same thing. How can we end this? Consumers, really. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I'm sure. I mean, you're all, you know, you know, around my age or even a little older. You remember when clothing suddenly got cheaper? Yeah. Suddenly it was like it cost nothing to buy clothes. Well, that's because that's because of this. That's because unions were broken and people are working for slave wages. So read the labels. Read the labels, and consumers have to be willing to say um, to you know Walmart and Kohl's and H and M and Zara and all those shops, we'll pay a few pennies more to know that it's humanely made, and we won't buy it um, if it's not. Right, so it was really interesting. I was teaching in London in 2010, and all these students, all these girls who shopped in those stores, started doing what they called flash mobs, and they would just go into Topshop and Zara and on Oxford Street in London, and they would, you know, they would start talking about how the clothes were made um, in the shops. So there's there's ways. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking how it all comes down to money, but the other side of it is we have so many people who really can't afford <coughs> right. more expensive clothes. Right. Um, middle class or upper class people can afford to make a stand, perhaps, but some people among us can't. Yeah, it's very complicated, um, and of course, you know, it comes down to raising the minimum wage, right, which is finally being raised for the first time in I don't know how many years, um, with all these predictions of economic gloom and doom. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, you're absolutely right. And, you know, and a lot of people who shop at, you know, Walmart shop there because they can afford to buy things they couldn't afford to buy elsewhere. Um, but, you know, that was the thing about Triangle and I think the need to publicize these other fires. In the end, even people who couldn't afford much were so horrified by what happened that few people were willing to say it was worth it to save, you know, then a few pennies, now maybe a few dollars, yeah. So can you be more specific about what we should look for? I mean, I look, you don't see clothing made in the United States, and you said that doesn't always mean, even if you see it, right. that it's made humanely. Okay, I get Walmart, but what should I be looking for? And, you know, like I'm in Vermont, you mentioned H, I don't even know what H&M yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very... Very low cost, um, popular, fashionable store. It's Swedish, actually, um, but it came to the United States. It's in all the big cities. Okay, well, yeah. you know, we don't got one. Right. So. <laughs> but no, I know. My daughter's very bitter about but, but that. Seriously, what should I look for? It's, you know, I mean, I don't know what I should or shouldn't be yeah. looking for. It's hard because there is no union label now um, and because, you know, unions are so, you know, decimated. Um, so you can't look for the union label. So, what you, you know, what you can do is you can look online um, and see who's, what stores are practicing unfair labor practices and you can you know, go into that store or you can write to that store on, online and say, you know, I'm not gonna shop there um, until things get better. The Gap, the Gap had a pretty effective boycott for a while um, and they did change their practices. Nike was shamed. I mean, they, they you know, brought famous feminist Jill Kirk Conway to go around and talk all about how it was so good for women, the way the shoes were being produced. Well, and they um, competition also now with New Balance and other shoes. Right. right. So, so and yeah, and your Gap and Nike are better. Mm -hmm. And the other labels? Which are Forever 21 is actually better, another one of these chain stores. Um, they also, they started to, um, they, started, they started to carry union-made clothes. Um, but it's not hard. There's a no sweat campaign. I mean, you can look up the no sweat campaign on the web. It's a student, um, student initiated campaign. One of the one of the kinds of campaigns that's been very successful is on college campuses. Logo wear is made. Colleges, you know, farm it out to get it really cheaply made. Dartmouth is one of those places. Um, Brown's um, clothing is now being made by the um, Alta Gracia Consortium in the Dominican Republic, which does pay their um, workers decently, and now they're unionizing. Um, so it's about raising consciousness. You have to raise your own consciousness because there's not. I mean, you, you know, you can find it out on the web. It's, it's, you know, it's 
not in signs everywhere or on you know TV commercials or even in in the press. But um, the Walmart campaign saved the lives. The pressure on on Walmart um, to put pressure on um, the manufacturers in some of these Bangladeshi um, cities saved the lives of four uh, organizers who were put on trial for murder unjustly. Um, so because there just there were enough there were enough emails to Walmart that they started to complain and, and the case got international recognition. So um, I think all those things are things you can do um, pretty successfully. There's, yeah. There's a label I see um, in the stores called Columbia and they're made in the USA and they last a long time. They're really well made and um, I don't know what their practices are so I'd have to go on the yeah. internet and look that up. Yeah. One place on the internet, the best place to look on the internet? Or well, the No Sweat campaign, no sweat um, and um, and the International Labor Federation. Um, you can go to. I mean, you can you can go to each of the countries, and you can see where you know what stores clothing is made for. Um, but um, I, in the United States, a lot of companies. I mean, there's this interesting trend where some companies are coming back, um, and one of the things they're selling is clothing made, um, or you know, shoe wear. There's an outerwear company that came back from Malaysia to Maine. Um, and, and, and they're selling the, these clothes are made um, by workers who are paid decently and, um, and working in safe conditions. So, uh, yeah. I just have a comment on that, which I think is hysterically ironic. Um, you know, they're now saying they're too expensive to produce in China, so they're moving to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. There's going to be no place left to go. Yeah, well, that's why they moved to Bangladesh. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Yeah. So there are people in China that still make 15 cents an hour and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, after all those glowing encomiums to uh, Steve Jobs when he died, the, you know, the story of how you know, iPads were made started to come out and the conditions were just unbelievable in China. Horrendous. Workers committing suicide because they were so bad. So, yeah, they're nice, nicely designed now. So what are your comments on the state of unions in America today, particularly with what happened in Wisconsin? Um, the, what's left of unions is public sector unions, um, and they're driven um, largely by um, by women of color, and um, the campaign against them. I mean, it, it really has been, you know, the deciding factor for people moving up out of poverty into, you know, unionized jobs um, in, you know, federal work, postal work, teachers, you know, nurses. Um, and I think that the I think that the campaign against public unions with all this kind of rhetoric of them being grasping and, um, you know, voracious and never satisfied and corrupt is just rhetoric. It's, it's just about women of color. Um, and and it's, it's racist and sexist and, and it's very effective. Um, it's very effective. But um, public sector unions remain pretty strong. So um, despite the Wisconsin law, um, which I believe was just held up in court, um, uh, so that it currently cannot be um, put into action. It's, it's obviously a rough moment for unions. I mean, one of the things that happened in, in doing all this triangle speaking is that people start talking about how do you turn around the views of unions because they're so they're so negative on my campus. You know, the um, service employees union, janitors, food service workers trying to fight against um, outsourcing and all the ways Dartmouth's trying to break the union. And um, you know, students are like, well, unions are bad. Right? You know, we can't have unions here. Unions are they're corrupt and they're so so that's part of the education process and part of why I do what I do. Short of something like this happening again in this country, what do you find is motivating people to get with it? I, I don't know. I mean I think it's I think it's a rough moment and um, you know, part of it is that there's no coverage. I mean, I think there does need to be some kind of coverage of, of these foreign factories where things are produced and, and uh, you know, movies and I mean, news. Come and talk. We yeah, come and talk. These people out there talking and getting us attention. Yeah. Well, one thing that the, um, the um, Bangladeshi garment workers made us all do in the rooms was they said, take the person next to you and look at the label on their shirt. Um, so. You know, start doing it and think about where things are produced and ask questions in the stores where you go and... <laughs>
You know, I, I, I guarantee it. One person goes up to the counter in a store and says, you know, I'd like to know some, if you know anything about how the things you sell are produced. Um, and, you know, they will pay attention. So, and Jordan. Jordan, yeah. A whole other story. No, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you.